distinguished ladies and gentlemen good morning it's a beautiful morning we are about to begin please may i request thank you Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I proceed to invite our Bursa and the person of Mr. Adeshino Abubakri to give us the opening prayer. The Bursa, sir. The Bursa, I understand, is not around. Let me call on uh, any of the deans. Lord is our strength, our song and 
Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Thank you. I can see that um, the Vice Chancellor again to grace the occasion. I want to thank you so very much, sir. I also can see that the Deputy Vice Chancellor Riza, in the person of uh, Professor Olaleko Asikia, is here. Please let's appreciate him as well. And uh, we have our amiable registrar in the person of Mr. Mayoku Olumeru. Please appreciate him. And of course, we have our passionate librarian, Mr. Josiah Olayomoye. He's here. Please let's appreciate him again. And of course, you want to appreciate yourselves as well, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, let me establish the protocols. The, the visitor in absentia, chairman and members of the Board of Trustees, Caleb University, chairman and members of the Governing Council, Caleb University, the Vice Chancellor, the management of Caleb University, the Senate and members, the deans, the heads of departments and heads of units, my dear colleagues, our wonderful students, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this is the culmination of our Founders Week and um, it is the Founders Day lecture and on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, I welcome you here. Of course, he will have the opportunity to say more to you as time goes on. But I just want to say that um, we are glad that we are here and we know that the Almighty God who has made today possible will take all the glory at the end of the day. Having said that, let me proceed to invite our own Vice Chancellor, Professor Nosa Owens, EPA, for his opening remarks. Let's hear it for the Vice Chancellor. You can do better than that. Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Great Caleb. Great Calebites. Great Calebites. It's like you are not, uh, I'm only hearing uh, Mr. Mitchell's voice. Can we hear our voices? Great Calebites. Great Calebites. Great Calebites. God bless you. You'll be great in Jesus' name. You know, the day you are born is always very, very important. And uh, this is the reason why we celebrate birthdays. And you know that uh, for some of us, we don't even celebrate our birthdays at home, as in home. We go to some special locations to celebrate their days. Okay, Life University, January 21, 2008, is our birthday. And that's the reason why we call it Founders uh, Day. And we, since that time, we never look back. So today is very special. How many of you are special that are here on this special day? You are special. You will indeed be special in Jesus' name. 
we have traditions in the university. And part of the tradition sometimes is to get some kind of individuals to come and feature in programs like this. But you notice that increasingly, the university has been subscribing to the logic that the young owns the future. This is UTD. Okonkwo Moneli is a young lady. Unfortunately, she could not come. And she requested a young man to represent her. His name is Femi Taiwo. A round of applause for him. Femi Taiwo is the executive director of League Africa. And he is somebody who is as international as you can get. He graduated not too long ago. That means that for you, you don't have to wait for too long to reach your goal. And she's accompanied by another very young lady who, uh, maybe you can let them see you. Uh, you're welcome. Today he will be telling, talking to us about private investors as a new piece of the new development agenda. There are 99 private universities in Nigeria as we speak, 99. And Caleb University is one very special private university in the park. You see, you need to appreciate what you have. I tell you, some years ago, somebody came in here. And the following day, which was a Saturday, he brought his entire family. He said he just wanted them to see. So they called me at the gate. And I said he should allow them to come in. He was so impressed. Are you impressed and are you happy that you are in Caleb University? My prayer is that the opportunity God has given each of us to be here will be something we'll testify about as we proceed in Jesus' name. So I want you to, you know, tighten your seatbelt and await the presentation that will give you inspiration for the place God is taking you. I want to assure you that by the time we are doing this program next year, we would have gone further and higher. I say you would have gone further and higher too. Your family would have gone further and higher. Nigeria would have gone further and higher. That will happen in Jesus' name. So I want to welcome you, especially on behalf of the proprietor, Dr. Oladega Adebogun, the Board of Trustees, the Governing Council, has been represented here by a member of the Governing Council, Mr. Dipo Ojedeji. Please, can you rise and let them see you? So you can see that even in our Governing Council, we have very young <laughs> people. So God bless you. You are welcome. Greater glory in Jesus' name. Let us appreciate the Vice Chancellor. If you are clapping, clap. There is no such thing as a half clap. Let's have a full clap. Thank you very much. Uh, the VCs, I stand on existing protocol. I will proceed now to present uh, a concise citation uh, on behalf of uh, the, our guest lecturer, Mrs. Didi Okonkwo Unneli, who is ably and ably represented by Mr. Taiwo here. Uh, sir, we are blessed once again at this Founders Day to have a woman of substance, a woman to celebrate, a woman to appreciate, a woman to admire as our Founders Day lecturer. She is indeed in all truism a woman of timber and caliber. I say that with a lot of confidence because I know the expression was before now reserved 
for men of repute, accomplishment, and popularity in their societies. But again, that is patriarchal. And as the world moves towards gender equity, I think we should also allow women who fall into that category to be so ably appreciated. So I dare and I call her a woman of timber and caliber. That deserves an applause from you. Mrs. Ndidi Okonkwamuneli was born in Enugu, Enugu State in March 1975. Her coming to this world, as a matter of fact, was arranged and delivered straight into aristocracy. What do I mean? Ndidi's father is a professor of pharmacology and her mother, an American a professor of history. So she was packaged and delivered right into aristocracy from the very beginning. She quickly placed through her primary and secondary school education before ending up in New York. With the same spirit and drive, Ndidi enrolled at the University of Pennsylvania and emerged a few years after with a bachelor's degree in multinational and strategic management. Soon after that, she topped the honor with an MBA from the prestigious Harvard Business School. With her impressive qualification, McKinsey and Company had no choice but to take her in as a business analyst. That position saw her shortly between Chicago and Johannesburg for quite a while. Later, she would serve as lead consultant to the Middle East Competitive Strategy and lead consultant to the Ford Foundation, amongst others. While she was immersed in the processes and procedures at McKinsey and Company, her vision was clear. She wanted to play a key role in enabling and facilitating wealth creation way back home. Therefore, when the time was right, precisely in the year 2000, she resigned from McKinsey and Company and returned to Nigeria. She immediately founded FATE, Faith Foundation. And after that, she joined forces with her husband, Mr. Mizuo Muneli, to co-found AACE Foods, Ace Foods. Soon after that, the couple founded the great Sahel group that we know today, a firm committed to unlocking African agriculture and nutrition potentials. The company has two subsidiaries, Sahel Capital Agribusiness Managers Limited and Sahel Consulting Agriculture and Ms. Ndidiwuneli, its husband. That means life, strength, and wealth. That also deserves an applause from you. NIA, a non-profit organization, sought to change the mindset of women so that they can realize that with hard work and determination, they can attain high levels of economic, professional, and political success, just like their male counterparts. Our distinguished Founders Day lecture proudly slabs on the boards of many blue chip companies and multinationals, including Nestle PLC, Nigeria Breweries PLC, Godrich Consumer Products India, Fairfax Africa and Canada, as well as Royal DSM Sustainability in the Netherlands. Put your hands together once again. There is also an inspiring list of awards and recognitions in honor of this great woman. And I will take just a few of them. She is winner of Global Leader of Tomorrow by the World Economic Forum 2002, Young Global Leader 2004, member of the Order of the Federal Republic 2004, Young Manager of the Year by This Day Newspaper, 2005. Excellence Award from the Africa Business Club at Harvard, 2007. If you are clapping, clap. 
Thank you. Excellence Award by the Anambra people, 2011. Forbes, Forbes 20 Young Powerful Women in Africa Award, 2011. Number eight now, Leading Entrepreneur Award by the Harvard Business School Club of Nigeria, 2013. Number nine, Change Agent of the Year by Awesome Awards, 2016. And 10, just to take 10 out of the uncountable list number of uh, awards, Africa Women Innovation and Entrepreneurship Forum Awards 2017. Put your hands together. Mrs. Ndidi Unele is married to Mr. Mesu Unele, and who is himself a co-manager of the Sahel Group and Ace Foods is blessed with a wonderful boy and a wonderful girl. The Vice Chancellor, sir, with great pleasure, allow me to present to you Mrs. Titi Okonkwa Wunele, who is ably represented by Mr. Taiwo. Put your hands together for him, please. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. My name is Femi Taiwo, and I'm a please standing on behalf of my principal and mentor, I would say, Mrs. Titi Wunele. Um, let me just do a bit of a background. The first time I ever met Mrs. Simonelli was in 2012. I remember very vividly. I met her um, on the grounds of the University of Oxford Site Business School in the United Kingdom. And I'd heard about this amazing lady. I remember meeting her there, talking to her about some of the works I was doing back in Nigeria, and taking her business card, sending an email after that. The title of the email was application for mentorship and she replied the mail and we tried booking a meeting for weeks but that did not happen because in the day like you most likely know is very 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 international the meeting never happened we just exchanged a few emails for fast track four years down the line in the year 2016 i had the opportunity to to work with her i literally got a message on linkedin that the organization she was running was looking for to reconstitute a leadership team. And I got recommended for the role. She didn't even remember that we had met. And then our conversation started. Now, NDD is one person that does not commit to something and walks away from a commitment. She definitely would have been here. That's the NDD that I know that I've worked with over these years. But for a, a loss and a barrier she had to attend, which came up after she had committed to this. That's the only reason why she's not here. And rest assured, she kept you in good hand um, and, and, and sent me here to come and represent her and share her thoughts. Um, one of the things Indidi wants to share today is the connection she has to, it, to the university community. One of the things the citation said in a little way is that Indidi was born and raised on, on, the, on university grounds. Her parents are professors, like you heard, and she grew up in the University of Nigeria in the campus. Coincidentally, her husband, too, is a product of university training, not just attending university, but also growing up on the campus of the University of Lagos because of his parents. And over the years, she has always stayed connected to higher education in different ways. And she's a senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy School, and presently she's a visiting scholar at McGill University in Canada. Together with her, I personally have been quite involved in university and higher education and education in different ways. I'm a product of a private university. Um, I graduated in 2009 from a very good university in here in Nigeria, a private school. Um, but once I graduated, I've been quite involved in the university and also very much involved in setting up and running the alumni organization of the university. I've also served as a vice president on the, on the alumni um, um, leadership council and also supported in different things in intervening and helping to build quite a number of things in the structures of the university made from the alumni point of view. 
But as my work as executive director in Lipa, in Lipa Africa, I'm privileged to work in the lead education programs in Nigeria and five other African countries. I've had the opportunity um, to consult and facilitate and lecture in different universities in, in, across Africa, Kenyatta University, USAI, USIU in Kenya, Ashesi University in Ghana, and a couple of others. And I'm excited about this topic that we're going to be sharing for the next 40 plus minutes. Private universities as the face of Nigeria's new development agenda. So this topic combines many things that, are, that Mrs. Umunelli is passionate about, and a passion I share alongside with her. We're passionate on one hand about higher education and what higher education can make happen. But not just higher education, private universities. And more importantly, we're passionate about Nigeria, the potential and the possibility of Nigeria, and I dare say the continent of Africa. One of the things we're going to be doing today is I'm going to first of all establish the development challenge that is facing us as a nation. And since we know that challenge and problems are one side of a coin, the flip side is, the, is opportunity, I'll be mapping the development challenge and opportunity that we are presented with right now in our nation and in our continent. And then we will go to explore the role of private universities in helping to deliver these development aspirations and development opportunities. And finally, we will be looking at what are the implications for school leadership, what are the implications for faculty, and what are the implications for students. Before I go any further, I just want to say thank you again and rest on the existing protocol and just you know, extend Mrs. Simonelli's gratitude for the opportunity to present um, this Founder Day speech. And to congratulate you again, happy birthday, Caleb University. Happy birthday. When we talk about Nigeria, talking about the problems in Nigeria is something every one of us are used to. We all know the situation we are in, in Nigeria at the moment. We are contending with many issues. Economic hardship, double digits, inflation, political uncertainty, Currency fluctuations in the past couple of years. We are seeing the impact of climate change and the environmental challenges happening up north and in the Sahel region. We are seeing a lot of religious fundamentalism, insecurity at unusual levels, rising unemployment, rising poverty levels, mental health crisis. The problems are enormous. Enormous. Growing population without a commensurate growth in a in economic activities. The problems are enormous, very enormous. I mean, if we just come from the angle of unemployment, record high unemployment in the nation, mostly affecting young people. We have one of the highest child mortality rates in the world, maternal uh, child mortality rates in the, in the world. We have the highest number of out-of-school children in the world. The problems are enormous. The statistics are daunting when we, when we look at it from any angle. And many people are trying to solve these problems from different points of view. Higher education has a significant part to play. And I dare say that private universities have a significant part to play. When we look closely at these problems, one thing we would have to come to is that Many of these challenges, if not all, are man-made problems. I mean, think about it. Unemployment, even climate change, was as a result of the negligence, the actions and the inactions of man. You know, the poor educational system, the low quality of governance that we have, all of these problems are man-made. Yamame. And I want to just rest on the word of Nelson Mandela who said that overcoming poverty is not a task of charity. It's an act of justice. And he alluded to the fact that like savory and appetite, poverty is not natural. It is man-made and it can be overcome and eradicated by the actions of human beings. 
And he even went further to say that sometimes it falls on a generation to be great. And we can be that generation that will be great. And he charged us to let our greatness close up. But deeper like he's called, recognize the fact that poverty, illiteracy, unemployment, and many of these challenges are man-made. One example of one of the reasons or one of the ways we can know it's man-made is that many people are not grappling with this problem. There are many nations in our world that, don't, that have single-digit inflation. Their unemployment rate is single. That maternal mortality or child mortality is next to zero. Unemployment, next to zero. Illiteracy, next to zero. So the problems we are grappling with in Nigeria and for most of Africa, when we are looking, when we are looking for solutions and when we are looking for who to blame, we had better put the mirror in our front. But he didn't just stop there to say these problems are man-made, but that the solutions will come from man. He went ahead and said, there comes a time when, when it falls on a generation. And drawing from that, the generation is you and I. We've had multiple generations post-independence, multiple forms of leadership. I mean, before the waves of private university, we've had a lot of public universities, and we do have them right now. But I think there's a reason why private universities have come to the mix. And our dear Vice Chancellor said there are over 99 private universities right now in Nigeria. And those universities represent the potential and the possibilities of what can become of Nigeria and what our continent can become. When we look closely at the Nigerian problem, one of the things we have to do is that we have to train our eyes to see opportunity. With all of these challenges I've, 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 I've highlighted, and the many more challenges that you're you familiar with, these are opportunities. They are literally calling for, for, for innovative leaders, calling for dynamic leaders, calling, calling for visionary leaders, calling for entrepreneurial leaders, calling for ethical leaders to arise, to awake, to rise up to the challenge. The interesting thing is that this problem is growing and multiplying. Africa has one of the youngest population in the world. Ten of the youngest countries, and I mean by youthful age, are in Africa. Nigeria is not even one of the best ten. And our median age is 18, which means 50% of Nigerians are below the age of 18. But in many other countries, quite a number of other countries in Africa, their median age is 14. So we're a very young, youthful continent and nation. But our nation, our continent is poised to double in size by 2050. So here we are grappling with, with these problems. With 200 million people in Nigeria and 1.2 billion people, or 1.2, 1.3 billion people across Africa. And this size is going to double, which means, are we going to be doubling the rate of unemployment? Are we going to be doubling the rate of out-of-school children? Because our solutions are not even catching up with our present demographic and our present population size. These are questions to answer. But on the other hand, these are opportunities. It means if we had to feed 1.2 billion, billion people, we would have to feed 2.4 billion people. That's business. That's possibility. If we had to clothe 1.2 billion people now, we would have to clothe 2.4 billion people. If we had to school hundreds of billions of people, we would have to double those numbers. Those are possibilities and opportunities. If, we are, if one in six youth, young people, according to African Development Bank, are in wage employment, we would have to create more jobs. These are opportunities for us to bring out the God-given talents and gifts and, and possibilities that are deposited within us. These are possibilities. These are according to the possibilities within us. The picture is similar in Nigeria, which is just a smaller part of the continent of Africa. We're going to double in size by 2050. We are still going to be a youthful continent, a youthful country by 2050. Our median age would increase just slightly. But the problems will still remain the same. 
and the opportunities will still remain the same. So, one of the big problems I want to highlight, which speaks to private universities, because private universities most often than not have a youthful population. It's young people you are educating. Average, your average, our average class size will be 18 to the early 20s, right? So, one of the biggest challenges that our country and our continent is facing and would face up until 2015 is something we call the huge transition challenges. Within these challenges are also opportunities, like I said. And these challenges were framed by the World Development Report. It identified five key areas that Africa and has to help their young people to grow in for Africa to fulfill its potential. One is education. How can we have quality education that prepares young people to take on leadership responsibility, to be able to be useful for the marketplace, to have values and capacity to deliver solutions? Education as one of the key transition areas to prepare young people to be effective and value-added adults. We talked about employment. How can we create more jobs to absorb the teaming youth that we would be have? How can we make sure that there's a skills match between the people who come out of university or who come out of our education or even our secondary education and, and who are needed in the marketplace? Access to health. How can we make sure young people have the knowledge and the resources to live healthy lives? This talks about mental health sexual reproductive health, and all forms of health. It talks about nutrition, social mobility. How can we provide resources for young people to grow out of their parents' home as quickly as possible? Access to mortgage, access to loans to start businesses, opportunities in society for the child of nobody to be somebody because society works. And finally, exercising citizenship. How can we create safe space for young people participate in democracy, to participate in policy making, in the decisions that affect them. How can we allow them to go out and carry placards and not shoot at them? These are some of the biggest challenges facing young people on the continent. But in still framing the challenge of development and the opportunities of development that we as higher education can rise up to, let's look at what the future is how the future is literally at our doorstep. Now, because I have to move around a lot and do a bit of consulting and facilitation and all kinds of work, I've come to taste a bit of the future. I've, I've, I've entered driverless cars, I've had drones deliver things to me, I've, all these things we see in sci-fi movies are literally not the future. They are happening today. It's, it's the reality of a lot of people in Abu Dhabi, in Silicon Valley, in San Francisco, in the United Kingdom. It's the reality of many people today. The fourth industrial revolution is literally here. In fact, the COVID pandemic accelerated the adoption of technology and the adoption of digitization across the continent. So, when we are thinking about preparing young people we need to understand that the world which we are preparing them for has changed dramatically and is changing at a faster pace. Artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, machine learning, and the likes, blockchain technology is revolutionizing how we are doing everything. Everything. It's changing the jobs, is democratizing access. It's one of the biggest opportunities for Africa to be proud. It's one of the biggest opportunities for private universities to outperform their, their contemporaries. And one of the biggest opportunities for private universities to drive development. And these are part of the things we'll be talking about in the next few minutes. Finally, one of the framings of the development opportunity and the challenge is the Sustainable Development Goals. It frames all the, all the, the 17 goals represent the aspiration of what a developed society can be 
from no poverty to decent jobs. This shows their aspiration. And I dare say that when we are thinking about our programming, you know, and our curriculum, and, and you know, the way we are designing our interventions and our programs in school, these are things to pay attention to even more closely. For young people here, when you are thinking about what you want to do in the future and how you would have to compete in a much more smaller global village, a talent market that is global, very, very global, I tell you for a fact. These are things to pay attention to in terms of accelerating your growth and your development. Now, with that background in mind, how can private universities position to deliver this development opportunity? How can Caleb University position to outperform others just by mere virtue of focus, by mere virtue of vision, by mere virtue of innovation? I am a strong believer that, I mean, you guys have read that book, David and Goliath, right? How many of you have read that book? Right? I'm not talking about the book in the Bible now. Right? You all know, you, okay, you've seen the movie 300. Don't lie. 300. Ahu, 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 right? For quite a number of you. You see, one thing the world has taught us, even for, not even, let's not even talk about Bible right now. Let's just talk about business space. Outliers can come and over, overtake things and overturn things. Small armies can conquer big armies. David can conquer Goliath. In fact, one of the things I always say is that, have you noticed that Goliath, have you noticed that big things like giants and elephants, there's something called ants at the end of them. You cannot spell giant without spelling ants, or spell elephant without spelling ants. But little people can take over big things. You can take over industry. It just takes vision, it takes strategy takes focus and it takes commitment. So private university can, for many reasons, outperform and deliver the development opportunity. They can be the, they did be the new phase of development, of driving the development agenda. Because the nation is sleeping. The bureaucracy in public systems is overwhelming. The lack of political will is overwhelming. In my work, I have to interface with Ministry of Education, interface with all manner of actors in government. Even when you have good people on the right seat, the amount of bureaucracy, the amount of systemic challenges they have to fight to deliver excellence is overwhelming. And you, we in private systems or private universities don't have those experiences. So how can we, how can private universities position as the new face? Now, there are two things I'm going to be establishing on. I'm going to emphasize more on the first than the second. The second is quite straightforward. The first is that one of the biggest things that private to the best, one of the ways you can step in significantly as a new phase of development is to develop leadership talent. And of course, the second one, because you are an higher institution, is to deliver relevant research outputs and thought leadership that would also drive development. Those are the two big things I, I want to emphasize, that Indidi wants to emphasize today. By the way, these are Indidi's thoughts primarily. I just added a few things. Um, now, let's, talk, let's go deeper into developing leadership talent to drive development. We just talked about all these problems and all these opportunities. Quite a number of people are trying to solve this problem. From public sector, across different, whether legislature, developing policies or laws, you know, to judiciary, to the executive, to organized private sector, to the not so organized private sector, to civil society and social sector. Different actors are trying to solve the problems in different ways, using different vehicles. Let me tell you one thing those, all those sectors lack. Those sectors lack talent. Those sectors are in need of leadership talent. And Pay attention to the fact that I'm not just saying talent. I'm saying leadership talent. Every sector. I sit on a few boards. I 
have had to sit on different beds for different different rooms for different organizations locally across Africa, outside of Africa. And even because Sleep Africa, our key job is leadership development. It's so it's overwhelming to see that there are a lot of opportunities waiting for talent to fail. On one hand, people are saying there are no, there are no jobs. On another hand, I know roles that people have been trying to fill for the past one year, 18 months. So where, what is happening? What is going on? In 2018, in one of Deep Africa's program, our school to work program, one of the things we basically do is, before we design programs, we want to design evidence-based solutions and evidence-based programs. So we do this assessment, we do research and survey, and all of that, and a systematic review of other solutions out there. So we put out a call to some of the top employers of labor and recruitment firms who hire graduates on behalf of some of the biggest organizations in Nigeria. And one of the questions we asked all of them, I'm talking about the big recruiters in Nigeria, we asked this question, do you think universities are preparing graduates effectively for the workplace? And 50% said no, not really. In fact, sorry, 50% said not really. 36.4% said no, categorically no. So these are the people that are the receiving end of talent and graduates. So let's just say from here, over 86% agree and affirm that, you know what, from what we are constantly getting, universities are not adequately preparing graduates for the marketplace. This was in 2018. I'm sure if we do that survey again in 2001, we would have something similar, if not even worse. So there's already a challenge on one hand. The quality of talent are not as good. And private universities can outperform in that. We've even seen examples of Catholic universities doing that. And definitely, public universities too are doing well. But what I'm just trying to say is that there's a big opportunity from the marketplace. There's a big opportunity. So the question we should ask is, what are they looking for? What do they qualify as prepared graduates, ready graduates, ready talent? So we asked other questions. We asked, do you consider grades First class, second class, during recruitment, 45.5% said no. 13.6% said yes. 14.9% said sometimes. So it, let's say that one is 50 50. And before you settle and say first class is not important, <laughs> it's a difference maker. You don't even like you. I graduated with a first class degree, right? In computer science, 2009. <laughs> so it's very, very important. I recruit people. As much as I don't necessarily look too much at first class, but the first class catches my attention. But I want to see other things immediately. Do you understand? It catches my attention immediately. Because it tells me you can be diligent, you can be committed. It tells me your IQ is probably, you can be focused, you can be disciplined. Right? But when I start seeing that with your first class, when you were on campus, you had student leadership, you were you did community development, you did this one, you did that or you wrote a book, or you did that, then I'm like, ooh, do you understand? So I'm just trying to say it's important, but it's not everything. In fact, many organizations right now don't even care about the PSC again. It was, it's already happening in the West, but it's happening in Nigeria as we speak. In Lip Africa, we have examples of people that don't need PSC. I mean, they came into the school, into the, into the organization, they, they grew within the ranks, the organization sponsored their first degree or something, a professional degree, and then even down to MBA some instances, right? Now, we ask them further, what skills and competencies do you look out for when recruiting new employees? And you hear things like communication skills, problem solving skills, those are the top things that you hear. Analytical skills, presentation skills, writing skills, digital literacy, organizational skills. One of the things, I mean, when we probed further, we started hearing who are the kind of people you are looking for. What does talent mean to you? We asked. What does talent mean to you? And they said problem solvers, people with a growth mindset, 
continuous learners, enterprising individuals, leaders, team players, critical and analytical thinkers, innovative and creative people, strong organizational skills, strong communication skills, high emotional intelligence, broad exposure and commercial awareness, digital awareness, and, and, and principled and val values driven, dynamic people. Long and short, they describe talent more by who than by what. So they were not describing talent necessarily by what. They were describing by who. And let me tell you, the best way to summarize all of these attributes is leadership. Talent. Because what they are speaking about are mostly soft skills. Let's move further. When you scan LinkedIn top skills being sought after, and you scan the World Economic Forum top skills, and all of these people that publish top skills, you will find this particular highlight for many of them. Complex problem solving skills. So I've moved on from our survey and I'm just talking about global now. Critical thinking, creativity, people management, which is leadership management, coordinating others, emotional intelligence, judgment and decision making, service orientation, negotiation, cognitive flexibility. You see that all of these guys are literally saying the same thing and seeking the same thing. The question is, how are universities preparing our youth for this new workforce reality? And how can private universities really, really, really take their place to deliver this kind of talent? It requires innovation, flexibility, vision, things that are easier for a private institution to do. Now, I'm going to establish this point by looking at, you know, McKinsey. McKinsey is one of the top strategy consulting firms. In 2018, they, del they delivered a report called, some, called the Skills Shift Report. They were, in that report, they were basically alluding to the fact that the skills required to be competitive and the, skill, the skills being demanded for have shifted and is shifting. So they said, because of automation and artificial intelligence and digitization, the need for physical and manual labor is reducing at 14%. So we don't need people in the Netherlands. Robots are the ones edging cows. Do you understand? And we were still talking about routing, routing or whatever, whatever. I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say. Tractors are driving themselves. Drones are harvesting. Physical labor is no longer required. It's reducing drastically. Nobody, I mean, Think about it. Even in our world, let's not forget about high tech. You have washing machines to wash your clothes. You have technology solving your problems in real time. So, general equipment operation and navigation, the factories of the future would have reduced number of physical need for physical and manual labor. They would have more need for big data analysts, business analysts. You know, artificial intelligence um, operators and all of that. So the need for physical and manual labor is reducing drastically. You can go and read that report. It's very interesting. Actually, it's um, Secondly, they said basic cognitive skills. The jobs like basic data entry, basic, basic data input and processing, the need is declining. Right now, OCR, you can, you can literally be talking and your phone is transcribing for you in real time. You can literally photocopy this now and you turn it to edit every day document. You don't need someone to retype something that has, been, that has been printed for you. Maybe you don't have the soft copy. Basic data input and processing. Even customer service. The, the, the first, best thing you interact with now when you call customer service is a bot. Basic literacy, numeracy, data analysis, those things. The need for them are declining significantly, significantly. Whereas the need for higher cognitive skills, creativity, the things that robots will not do easily. Complex, complex information processing and interpretation. The need for social and emotional skills. Entrepreneurship and initiative taking. Leadership and managing others. Emotional intelligence. And obviously, the need for technological skills are increasing rapidly. This is a skill shift going on. And private universities 
in a position to develop talent, leadership talent with higher cognitive skills, with very solid and strong social and emotional um, attributes, who are technological savvy. It's not about being programmers here. Right? So that we can outperform in that. Now, when we even think about where are the opportunities, I'm going to move very fast now. When you map the job opportunities in Nigeria and the possibility for job creation, four industries come alive in Nigeria. And this, this is based on recent law that Galbeck, one of the biggest development consulting firms, in the partnership with Mastercard Foundation, which is very big on job creation and all of that. One is the service industry. Service industry is very broad, telecoms, healthcare, financial institutions, and the value chain. The creative industry, entertainment, music, culture, fashion, and all of this. The, 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 the opportunity for job creation is enormous. Digital and, and technology, obviously, is where the job is shifting to. And agribusiness, the entire value chain. Don't forget the, the statistics we started with. Africa is still important most of the schools from outside of Africa. We need to get Africa to build the world. And 65% of the world's land is in Africa. Right? So definitely, one of the opportunities for, for private sector and private institutions, private higher institutions, is that we can actually become a talent bank. We can develop the kind of talent people are looking for. We can create the environment, the training. You know, the safe spaces for this kind of talent to emerge. I'm going to talk a bit about how these talents emerge in a bit. But these talents will be known for self-leadership, entrepreneurship. But entrepreneurship doesn't necessarily mean you start business. It means you're an entrepreneur. Nobody's looking for someone to come and maintain things again. People are looking for, for people that can come and take things from where they are to where they can be. And that requires entrepreneurship, you know, a form of entrepreneurial acumen. Transformative leadership, digital and financial literacy. Right? And these are some of the things we do in Lip Africa, at both the secondary education level, which, which we are very big about. I mean, we focus on secondary education for one reason. Just to, let me just give you this statistic. In many parts of Africa, only one in four or one in five people get to, higher, higher, get to go to higher, higher education. Think about that. Only one in four or one in five, depending on the country you, you, you analyze, get to go to university or anything, anything higher education. That means every one of us here, whether you are going through a degree or you go through a degree, they are part of the privileged few. They are part of the 25% or less than 25% who ever and who has ever had higher education on the continent. So that means we should actually be the ones at the forefront of development. Because we are the most, we are, we are, we are the most educated, the good. And their education has to count for something. So let me move very fast. I'm going to talk about, since I'm talking about leadership here, leadership talent, let me go into now, there's a difference, obviously, between leadership and management. Peter Jockard, you know, in one of his seminar papers, talked about management, you know, the difference between management and leadership. He said, management is doing the right, doing things right. That means you can maintain systems, you can maintain processes. Leadership is doing the right things. The world is changing and moving. Leadership, you are, you are dynamic and innovative to move with what is moving. You can reinvent a new future because the, the, the environment changes. You can be visionary. And I know when we talk about leadership, we're talking about visionary and innovating. You can have foresight. You can reimagine things. You can reimagine new possibilities. You can reimagine new, new, new ways of teaching. New. Right? Both of them require effective decision making and you know, similar skills and competencies. But when you look deeply at leadership, there's a form of character required, a dimension of character development requires to be an effective leader. There are capabilities that are required of you. Capabilities to rally people, to inspire people, to make people, to organize ideas, to make decisions. There's a level of commitment to mission and vision and to a cause, to purpose that is required of leaders. Leaders don't casually decide. They don't casually stay in an organization. They have strong ownership quotient. They do everything they do as if they own it, as if everything stops at them. They understand that if anything is up to, is to be, it is up to me. There's a deep, deeper dimension of commitment between a leader and a man. Leaders have a stake. Right? And as students, as administrators, and as faculty, 
and as private universities, we need the combination of leadership and management, excellence, to fill this void that our nation and our continent desire. So, let's quickly wrap up with this. What are the key considerations for different people in the room here today? For leadership, management, and administrators, this is a call to be more visionary, to be more ambitious for this righteous cause that you're giving yourself to. This is a time to think more deeply about what your vision for the what's your vision for the role that your university must play in shaping the future of Nigeria. This is not a time to just be dishing out degrees and just be bring no, we, we bring them in factory, we go, we take them out. This is a time to say, what is the vision? What is the goal? What, what is the so what of our university, of our institution? This is a time to say, what are the kind of graduates we want to produce? What, is, what kind of leaders do we want to What kind of leadership talent do we want to offer to the private sector? What kind of leadership talent do we want to offer to the social sector? What kind of leadership talent do we want to offer to the public sector? How are we preparing them? What does this mean for the for everything, for the way we design our hostel, for the way we design cafeteria, for the student affairs division. What does that mean? Who are the people doing it? Well, locally and internationally. What can we learn from them? Because vision is foresight, based on insight, with the benefit of insight. How did Harvard do it? How did Yale do it? Those are the questions. This must be our our, our own most content for this knowledge, for this insight, for this insight, so that we can be inspired to a vision and drive that vision. Because the truth of the matter is that you can't give what you don't want. Like I always tell my team members, you can't drink Gary and commit conflict. No, you can't. <laughs> it's the truth. You can't, it's what you see, you have to take it in. We have to breathe it in. That means we have to commit to capacity building for ourselves as leadership and management and as administrators. We have to open ourselves to these new technologies. We have to say, what is decentralized by now? What is even this blockchain all about? This Bitcoin that my students are always looking at, what is this Bitcoin all about? We have to be inquisitive. We have to. Another key question is, what will be my unique research contribution. We are all academics here. So to all the, to all the you know, even as administrators, if you want faculty to do it, you yourself have to do it. So before you even say, definitely as a university, as a university, you used to say, what would be my unique research contribution? I was on a strategy meeting this past week for what leadership institute that is about to talk in Pan-African leadership. And when you know, we were trying to ask, what is the why for this why is this work relevant? Why is it important? One of the questions we ask ourselves is that when you want to study, when you are studying to develop your leadership skills, which, how many local reports or local materials do you constantly have? Or authors do you constantly have? One of the major ways I feel my leadership and management capability consistently is I read about business review. I've been doing that for more than a decade. I knew that, see, you know, one of the major, see, is your vision that places an urgency for development, capacity building of today. I knew that the way, where I want to go to, the speed at which I want to go into it, you know, and the vision I had for myself and the contribution I wanted to make, I needed, I needed to prepare myself. I needed to be competitive anywhere in the world. As much as I'm willing to read anything, it's very difficult to from anywhere. A, a consistent, not just a one-off publication. Other business review generates content every day. One out of research. So, you know I said that we emphasize leadership talent. We don't even go to research. The opportunities for R&D is the enormous. Enormous. That's one of the ways we, you can literally outperform globally and really set yourself within the global ranks as a, as a private institution, a university. 
and it doesn't even necessarily mean high tech. It doesn't mean research in bio, bioinformatics and all those things. Are, all of them are good. All research is good that is relevant for society. But people say even in social sciences, even in development challenges, when we have to write, when, you know, whether we are working on proposals in partnership with World Bank or Pina Media Gates Foundation, it's very hard to quote Nigeria. It's very hard to quote a Nigerian lecturer. It's not. I know there are quality outputs in some areas, but they're even difficult to find. That shows a big opportunity that private universities can. When you even look at the industry, every industry has its own challenge. All those challenges are opportunities for research and development. So what unique research will you contribute? Leadership requires focus. So there are many opportunities for research, but which one can we even say, you know what, let's build capacity. If you are an HOD, you know, you, 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 you're the faculty lead, how can you position that your department to be world class? One person I, I, I read a lot, and I've read a lot is Peter Drucker. You know, when you read about Peter Drucker, you realize that Peter Drucker had the opportunity to go and be a lecturer and a researcher in all the best universities you can imagine. But he just a, 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 a business school that was not well known. But from that place, his light went out. He shone as a bright light in the entire world. All of his pieces were from there. He became highly sought after. So it's not about where you are, it's about what you put into where you are. Now, how would we help our students and alumni achieve? It's very important to start thinking more strongly about alumni. Because alumni is the realization of the vision of the vision of the university. It's the realization. So we have to pay attention to alumni development more strongly. How will we shape public discourse and private discourse right now? Relevance is, is by participation. Values-based values -based participation. 2023 is coming. What, is, what are you saying as a university? What output are you generating as a university that is relevant? in the public discourse? What output are you putting out that is relevant in the development, in the, in the private sector discourse, or in the development community? How will you partner with the private, public, and non-profit sector to shape your state and, unit and country? See, one of the big opportunities is partnership, to leapfrog any institution to play as the new face of development. That's one of the, that's, that's partnership. So you can't do it all. What partnership? Two universities that are doing that, that very well in Africa. It's Africa Leadership University, Africa Leadership Group by Press Wanika, and um, Ashesi University, Patrukawa. I've had the opportunity of going to these universities, you know, to go and speak or, or do one thing or the other. But the quality of partnerships and what partnerships are brought back to them amazing. Because I work in the development sector, and one of my work is also participating in, in, in fundraising and a couple of that. I know, for instance, the amount of resources Africa Leadership Group has raised from philanthropists to develop their university. So that world-class facility they have was because of partnership. Same thing with Ashesi University. So how, because I know these things cost money. Hey, these things cost money. I appreciate that very well. It's not easy to run any institution, more or less a, a private university. I know that the tuition doesn't cover it. That's the truth. Then finally, how would we create safe spaces for our students, especially female students? These are questions to consider, you know, in the process of raising leadership talent. Now, let me move faster. Another key thing I would like us to pay attention to, because it's young people we are dealing with. There's something called the Positive Youth Development Framework, which speaks to, which speaks to how to raise able, capable young people who stand on their own. And it is recognizing that young people are not a problem to be solved but they are valuable contributors in the solutions you want to do. So I want to say that one of the major resources you have to develop your university 
are your students. They have their idea. They have innovation. They have the energy. And we can tap into that resource more to help position this university for greatness. So the positive youth development framework might be one interesting thing to consider. To say, how are we developing the assets, the agency, the contribution of our young people? And how are we creating an enabling environment to develop leadership talent? The PYG framework is well known for developing holistic, as an effective tool and framework for developing holistic leaders. So that's something to pay attention to. And there are innovative ways we can do this. I talked about Shesi University a minute ago. Let me tell you one thing Ashesi University did. Ashesi University's goal is to develop leadership talent. Ethical, entrepreneurial, innovative leader. Do you know that when you enter Ashesi, every student has to sign an honor code voluntarily, of which over 98% signed it. But as part of that honor code, it is zero tolerance to corruption and cheating. So Ashesi University is the only university I know in the world where exams are originator free. Believe it or not. And they've been doing it for years. So they were like, you know what? We are going to establish a trust accord with you. We are raising you to be beacons of light. Ethical leaders out there. Let's give you an opportunity to practice ethical leadership there. That means we have to hold ourselves accountable. That's what they do. They allow students to hold themselves accountable. They've had to rusticate students that cheated, but it was the student community that pitched them out. Because there are implications. So those are interesting I mean, that's just one interesting idea. Let me give another example of one thing I learned from Africa Leadership University Group. Because they're trying to raise leadership talent, they told their students, we are not interested in your major, we're interested in your mission. So you will hardly find you either have to find a lecturer saying, what's your major? What's your major? That means what's your course of study? It was your mission. Because guess what? Your three, four, five years in a year institution is a while. Your life is really out there. So the question is, is this a preparation for life? What is that? What's your vision? What's your vision? So I can say, as, as students here, don't think, I mean, pay attention to your course. C-O-U-R-S. But pay attention strongly to the cost that you want to give your life for and give your life to C-A-U-S. Pay attention. What mission do you want to do? see? Your mission will help you to pay attention to your major. I tell you for a fact. Because your mission will demand another dimension of preparation and excellence from you. Very important. Thank you. Thank you. In the process of raising leadership talent, still on the administrator, I know some of the things that are top of mind for you is how would you scale what you are doing? You have dreams for growth. As I was coming, I was seeing this is the site for school for agriculture. This is the site for this one. Powerful vision for growth and for scale. And I know one of the things the vice chancellor said I should do is that we actually bring some copies of this book. MDD, you know, is, is, is an action researcher. She doesn't just do her work, she also studies, you know, uses a, a, the opportunity of participating in academic society to develop materials that are tied to research. So we bought a bit of the material. Um, this particular one is called Scaling Innovation in Africa. And the book is built around this model, studying some of the institutions that have scaled their work significantly. Talking about the role of mission, value, structure, the pathways to scale, think, rethinking the business model, leadership and talent to scale, financing to scale, partnerships to scale, and your theory of change, thinking about all those things. Very important, very beautiful material. Now, very quickly, my time is just a few more minutes. Faculty members, I mean, I've already started talking, but let, let us go a bit deeper. If, if, if the world is looking for people with those dimensions of soft skills and leadership talent, you are probably one of the most important people in shaping and raising this talent because you spend more face time with them. So the question is, one question to consider is, how are you retooling and reskilling to ensure that your approach is cutting edge? The way you deliver your sessions, how are you using or how would you start using to 
21st century pedagogy in delivering your classes. There is no point teaching theoretically again. There is no point. The problems out there are real. We have to bring the problems out there in here. We have to interact with those problems in here. We have to challenge students in here for what is happening out there. I know that you are constrained by curriculum and education. I mean, we'll get there to change them. But, you know, even though they're giving you the letter, you can provide the spirit. You get that? I mean, it's a faith-based university. They're giving you the letter of what to teach. But you can provide the spirit. You can do it in a different way, a unique way. Because, back to what we established as what talent means to many of the people out there, those soft skills are not taught. They are taught. Team working, collaboration, problem solving. You don't teach people what is problem solving. It's the environment and the programming you have put into the way you deliver your class and into your students that produces this kind of people. And those skills are best delivered by experiential learning. And I love this experiential learning model that David Cole taught. So this is my challenge to you, faculty. That can you make sure that the students going through your courses have a concrete experience as part of your lectures. A concrete experience means that what is out there comes alive in your classroom. If a, a classical example of a methodology is the case methodology that Harvard Business School made popular. That's an experiential one because they will teach you almost anything, but they're using the case method. They're using real life cases to teach you. Do you understand? So, the tower and gown you do is part of the experience, giving people experience. The expulsions you foster, the documentaries you will play in your classroom, concrete experience. The role playing and the exercises you give them, concrete experience. The next is reflective observation. Demand that they reflect and produce the products of their reflection. Abstract conceptualization. And allow, give them the space to practice. Practice, to practice what they do or what, what you're teaching them. And like I said earlier, what we said will you contribute nationally and globally to advanced thinking? How can you contribute to preparing students for success in life? Now, I'm going to head with students. Because all of these establishments and all of these individuals in faculty, in leadership, exist to prepare you for leadership talent. You yourself have to pay attention to your growth and development. Because they can't do it for you. They can't do it for you. They are doing their best and they will continue to improve their best. But you have the responsibility to develop yourself. So the question is, how are you preparing yourself for 20, 21st century leadership? How are you preparing yourself to compete? Don't think your competition is in that graduate or competent university right? Your competition is a chess. Your competition is they help you as, as talent now. Your competition is Harvard University graduate. When it comes to the marketplace, everybody are the same. Except what makes them different. And guess what? Nobody cares about gender or the color of your skin. Excellence is excellence. Excellence is excellence. So it's your responsibility. Despite all the challenges and all the limitations you might have to prepare yourself for that mission, for that assignment. It's your responsibility because as long as you continue, you will always have the name of Caleb University. It's your responsibility to make sure that Caleb University swans high. And that's a good story to tell. And it's not dragged on Twitter. It's your responsibility to position yourself as that talent that can drive the development agenda. It's your responsibility to build a strong alumni that will support yourself and support the institution in the future. More important is your responsibility to find your purpose. To, you know, Ephesians 2.10 is one of my favorite schools. The Bible says that we are God's masterpieces. We created in Christ Jesus unto good works which we are predestined to do. So there are good works you are predestined to do. There are there are paths that have been predestined for you to walk in. Why not find that purpose? 
you know, and I love, I love this Venn diagram here. You know, that, that just says, you know, purpose is a mix of what you do well, what you love doing, what the world needs, and what you can get paid for. That sweet spot where your passion, your personality, your giftings, your talent, your aspirations are catered for. That is purpose. And I leave you with this thought by Martin Luther King Jr., who said, life's most urgent and important question. And that's the basis of choosing, of finding what you are called to do. Because what you are called to do is for others. Nothing was created for itself. The chairs we are sitting on don't sit on themselves. This mind doesn't speak to itself. The projector does not project itself. We are created for a purpose. And it's definitely to serve others and to serve our God. So in this final word is Caleb University must become a beacon of hope. And excellence for Nigeria, for the Nigeria we deserve. So Caleb University must become a beacon of hope. Amongst the new phases of development, of private universities driving development, Caleb University must stand strong as a beacon of hope and excellence for the Nigeria we deserve. Preparing the next generation of young leaders with a space to value their network to transform their country. Thank you so much for the privilege. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. That was a, a very brilliant expository from Mrs. Ndidi Okonkwo Muneli and uh, ably presented by Mr. Taiwo Femi himself. Once again, let's appreciate the presenter. Uh, sir. If, if you don't mind, uh, we will continue. I know you had your time here, but there's a little ceremony in honor of your principal. We will appreciate her with a little gift and we'll also appreciate you and your team. So let me call on our dear Vice Chancellor Risa, Professor Laleko Asikia, to superintend over that little ceremony. Please appreciate him.
know the organogram of the university is such that we have the visitor, then we have the council members. Anything we want to do in the university, we present it to them, they must approve. And they bring in their superior inputs into whatever we want to do. So I call on the, the man that is representing the council of Caleb University at this great occasion, Mr. Ojedej. Put your hands together for me. So on behalf of the visitor of the university, and of course the council that you are representing, <laughs> and all the students that are here and the management, we present this. Thank you, please. Yes, um, yes, Mr. Femi Taiwo will, you know, present something to the university through the Vice Chancellor. Sir, please, thank you. Right, thank you so much again for the opportunity to have us here. Mrs. Iwunali um, gave us some copies of our book. Um, one of them is Reaching Millions with Impact, the one I referred to uh, during the lecture. Uh, and it's a powerful book for social innovation uh, in Africa. And she has this of the across education, healthcare. Then our most recent book, uh, when Indidi left the Africa in 2008, but well, since that time till now, she has spent most of her time um, in the agricultural sector. It's amazing that she, she, went, she excelled in youth development and entrepreneurship, and then moved to another industry and also excelled. And more recently, she released a book called Food Entrepreneurs in Africa, Healing Resilient Agribusiness. And so, on behalf of Mrs. Iwune, the class together for the time. wonderful program. We thank God for how far he has taken us. We know he will continue to see us through right through to the end successfully and will give all the glory to his holy name. Let me then proceed by calling on our registrar, Mr. Mayoko Olumeru. He will give the vote of thanks and make necessary announcements where we, we need them. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. I, I, I could see you were so excited when the vice chancellor removed his mask. <laughs> Never mind. Just, just pray that COVID will end very soon. And you will see more of his handsome face. The council member representing council here present, Mr. Deepo Jedegi. The Vice Chancellor, Sir, Professor Nosa Owens Ibi. The Deputy Vice Chancellor, Risa, here present. The Librarian, here present. The Dean, the Directors, Heads of Departments, Heads of Units, here present. All the staff members here present, and the great, I say, good morning. You see, Giving a vote of thanks for five minutes, I don't know what you expect me to say for five minutes other than to say thank everybody, you know, and we go home. But let me quickly point out one or two things from the speaker before I thank the speaker and the team especially. The problems and challenges today are opportunities, he said. These challenges are man made, and I dare say, if there are opportunities in problems and challenges, problems and challenges will never end in our world. Oh, that's not a cause 
is not a curse. It will never end because problems and challenges are opportunities. The reason why you've come to university is so that you can go out and solve problems. If we're not anticipating problems, there probably wouldn't have been any reason for you to be in an institution like this. So challenges will never stop because they are business opportunities. In fact, when they're about stopping, men will create more so that there will be more business. He spoke about David overcoming Goliath. And I remember the history of Standard Trust Bank and UBA. You know how Standard Trust Bank acquired UBA? The man Tony Elunedo had that vision that he was going to be the like his was going to be the largest bank around. And he achieved it by acquiring something bigger than his own organization. He spoke about Nigeria being the food basket. And I remember Zimbabwe. At a time, in fact, until 2000, the year 2000, Zimbabwe was the bread, bread basket for Africa. He spoke about Asheshi University, where cheating attracts expulsion. And of course, I know in some other universities, that's the case. And all this set me thinking, kind of. He spoke also about project-based learning. And I want to, you know, at a point in time, I felt you should just stop and send us back home. Let's go and digest the little he had told us before going on. But, sir, I want to thank you. I want to appreciate you. And I want to appreciate, more importantly, the principle that sent you, Mrs. Ndidi Okonko Uneli. Uh, on behalf of the visitor, the board of trustees, the council, uh, the management of Caleb University, the entire Caleb University community, I want to say thank you for coming. We appreciate you. We thank you, and we know we'll see more of you. Thank you very much. I also want to thank all the members of the Caleb University community. We are here because you are here. And I know we are forward-looking, and we will move forward. I said we will move forward. These lectures, they are no time-wasting activities. By the time we come back next year, we will be able to come up with our scorecards. We score ourselves, and we see how much we have achieved. And the Lord will cause it to be so in Jesus' name. Once again, I want to thank everybody. Have a wonderful time. Yes, we can do better for our dashing and amiable acting registrar. Let me say this before we get to the next item. Please, when the procession is leaving, I want everybody to stand in their places and not shuffle about. It's after the academic procession has left and other, that others can go. Please, let's do things in a very orderly fashion and God will help us. Put your hands together for yourselves again. Okay then, so um, it's my duty to once again call on our TV series uh, to say the closing prayer. Please, let's hear it for him, please. Appreciate him. We should all rise. God bless you.
let your presence go with them. The little we have heard about them, we pray that you push them from glory to glory. You will make things to happen in their lives, in their organization, and in everything they represent in the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord, for the council member that came, that your presence will go with him. We pray that the knowledge that he has also gained from the meeting, we will use it to guide and to shape all the things we are doing here at Caleb University in the name of Jesus. As a people, as a university, we pray, Lord, that you will move us forward in your purpose and in the direction of the knowledge that we have received. And we pray for the students that you will help them to be able to prepare for the world of work and not to be absent-minded or to lose sight of the challenges out there. Inside every challenge is an opportunity. So it has been said, and so we pray that our students, all of them will be leaders in their own right in the name of Jesus. Because the Lord will do for us more than what we have prayed for. We shall celebrate as a university. Thank you, Father, for in Jesus' precious name, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I crave your indulgence. Please keep standing. Next is the school anthem and then the national anthem. And then there will be the procession going out. Let's do it in an orderly fashion and God will help us. The Caleb University anthem, please. Hilda is still so great, so brave and full. Yeah. Hey. 
very much, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. We have come to the end of this program. But please remain standing in your place as the academic procession will go back in reverse order. Thank you. God bless you.